In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Since the daily Sunday readings have been supplanted by the readings of the saint commemorated today, the Holy Apostle and Evangelist Luke, I thought it would be good to comment on three aspects of our faith. The first is our Gospel lectionary. As Orthodox Christians, we should be reading the Scriptures daily, as prescribed by the Orthodox Church, that is, the daily Epistle and Gospel readings. And if not, we should at least make an effort to read them at least on Saturdays and Sundays when we have off of work. So the annual cycle of Gospels for the Holy Orthodox Church is composed of four series. The first being the Gospel of St. John, <coughs> which is read from Pascha until Pentecost Sunday. The second is the Gospel of St. Matthew, divided over 17 weeks, beginning with the Monday of the Holy Spirit, that is, the day after Pentecost. And from the twelfth week, it is read on Saturdays and Sundays, while the Gospel of St. Mark is read on the remaining weekdays. The third is the Gospel of St. Luke, divided over 19 weeks, beginning on the Monday after the exaltation of the Holy Cross. From the thirteenth week, it is read only on Saturdays and Sundays, while St. Mark's Gospel is resumed and read on the remaining weekdays. And the fourth is the Gospel of St. Mark, which is read chiefly during the Lenten period on Saturdays and Sundays. The great liturgical scholar and professor Nicholas Uspiensky writes concerning the Gospel lectionary. The first Christian feasts were established as the Church's witness to the world of the divine dignity of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the historicity of his incarnation. None of the evangelists more deeply revealed the divine personhood of Jesus Christ than did the Apostle John, the theologian. And nothing confirms more powerfully the Lord's divine nature than the fact of his resurrection. Therefore the Church prescribed that from the Feast of Pascha through the period of the fifty days, the Gospel, according to John, would be read. Of the feast celebrated on the immovable dates of the year, the most ancient is the Feast of Christ's Nativity. The establishment of the practice of celebrating that feast on December 5th soon gave rise to the appearance of the Feast of the Annunciation of the Most Holy Theotokos on the 25th of March, as the day of the conception of Jesus Christ by her. But the event of the Annunciation took place in the sixth month after the conception of John the Forerunner, following the appearance of the angel to St. Zechariah. On this basis, two feasts were established. The conception of St. John the Forerunner on the 23rd of, December, or the 23rd of September and his nativity on the 24th of June. Yeah. These sacred events, which preceded the incarnation of the Son of God, are attested to by the evangelist Luke only. And for this reason, the Church has prescribed that on the Monday after the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, the Gospel of Luke is to continue in sequence. The Lucan jump, as this is called, is related to the chronological proximity of the Exaltation of the Cross to the conception of the Forerunner, celebrated on September 23rd. In late antiquity, this feast marked the beginning of the ecclesiastical new year, thus the beginning, thus beginning the reading of the Lucan Gospel towards the middle of September can be understood. The reasoning is theological and based on a vision of salvation history. The conception of the forerunner constitutes the first step of the new dispensation, as mentioned in the Matins Stichira of that feast. Again, St. Luke is the only evangelist to mention the account of our, of our Savior also related to this. St. Luke is also the only evangelist to mention the account of our Savior reading the prophecy of Isaiah in the synagogue, which we read on the liturgical new year, which is now celebrated on September 1st. The second thing I'd like to speak about is St. Luke in his Gospel 
and why he is symbolized by the ox. In Christian art, each of the four evangelists has a particular symbol. The symbolism has its origins in two biblical texts, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. St. Matthew is symbolized by a winged man or angel. His gospel starts with Joseph's genealogy from Abraham. It represents Jesus' incarnation and so Christ's human nature. This signifies that Christians should use their reason for salvation. This gospel also begins and ends with God is with us. For as he states, and the name Emmanuel means God with us, and his gospel ends with our Savior's words, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. St. Mark is symbolized by a winged lion, a figure of courage and monarchy. The lion also represents Jesus' resurrection, as Christ being a sleeping king. St. Luke is symbolized by a winged ox or bull, and we will come back to this in a minute. St. John the Theologian is symbolized by an eagle, a figure of the sky, and believed by Christian scholars to be able to look straight into the sun. His gospel starts with, eternal, with an eternal overview of Jesus the Logos, and it goes on to describe many things with a higher Christology than the other three synoptic gospels. It represents Jesus' ascension and Christ's divine nature. This symbolizes that Christians should look on eternity without flinching as they journey towards their goal with union with God. So returning to the choice of the ox for St. Luke is because it is related to being a creature known for its strength, reliability, sacrifice, and service to mankind. St. Luke's Gospel starts and ends in the temple. As we previously mentioned, only St. Luke records the infancy narratives, that is, the events leading up to the birth of the Savior. Very early on in the Gospel, St. Luke tells the story of Zechariah the High Priest, the father of St. John the Forerunner, offering sacrifices to God in the temple. The Gospel account also speaks of the Theotokos' role in Christ's life and the sacrifices that she voluntarily made in order to usher in God's plan of salvation for mankind. This can be seen, for example, when Joseph and Mary present Jesus in the temple as an infant. The prophet Simeon tells Mary that a sword will pierce her heart. St. Luke is the only evangelist to relate this account, as well as when the Savior is later found there among the doctors asking them questions. And lastly, St. Luke emphasizes the Savior's role as both high priest i.e. the one making the sacrifice, and the sacrifice itself through his voluntary passion and crucifixion. Lastly, St. Luke's contribution to the Church. As was mentioned in the Epistle reading, St. Luke was a physician, a doctor by training. He would later become one of the church's central historians, not only writing his gospel account, but also the Acts of the Holy Apostles. These two books constitute in volume about a quarter of the New Testament canon. Furthermore, he was also credited as being the first iconographer Having spent much time with St. John the Theologian, who was placed in charge of the care of the Most Holy Theotokos by the Savior, St. Luke painted several icons, several of which still remain with us to this day. St. Luke's genealogy, mentioned in his third chapter, 
traces a different lineage, a slightly different lineage than St. Matthew, tracing it through the line of the Theotokos. St. Luke spent much time with the Theotokos, not only painting her, but learning about her life and recording her role in the history of salvation in his gospel. This gospel is slightly stylistically different than the other synoptic gospels, and he includes some other details as a true historian would, details about certain events and places. His gospel is also written from a less masculine perspective, and often women, and especially the downtrodden, not only women but also men, find his gospel very approachable and very intimate, as God is seen as one who comes among his people, who heals them, who descends from on high and truly bears their burdens in a sacrificial manner. So for women, I usually recommend, and seeing as we have a majority of the congregation here, our faithful congregation being women, I would highly encourage you during this time where we, re where we read the Gospel of St. Luke liturgically. But also, as we prepare to, to, to uh, go through Advent and then celebrate the Nativity, to familiarize yourself with the Gospel of St. Luke. So to brothers and sisters, let us never forget the contributions of all the saints, but especially of the Apostle and Evangelist Luke, who we celebrate today, who was truly a polymath and a great contributor to our, not only history of the Church, but also our understanding of Christ, his story, and his mother's story, and the story of the forerunner. So may God, through his prayers, grant us all wisdom and understanding and illumination. And may we, too, be led through the compunctionate writing of the gospel to understand God is merciful and ready to save all of us who wish to be saved.